please warmly welcome Michelle to the stage for her Creative Catalyst talk titled, Preparing Students for an AI-Driven World, Practical Approaches for Schools. Round of applause for Michelle. As a teacher, I have to say, it's really hard to put a bio together because all you want to say is, hey, I've stood in front of a group of year nines and survived. Isn't that enough? Do you really need to know anything more than that? Um, I am lucky enough uh, to work at Halebury, um, which is a very large school. I am in Sydney, so you guys don't know who we are, which is very fine. A bit weird in Melbourne because we've got four campuses, so we're used to people going, oh, yeah, you're just around the corner from us. Um, we're also in Darwin, China, and last year we launched our online school, which was has been exceptionally fun, um, and I'm lucky enough to teach one of our online classes in media. Um, as we looked at things like that we were sharing this morning about Adobe, it reminded me just how much has changed over the last two years. Uh, we thought that, you know, going through the pandemic, that was enough, but technology is throwing new things out at us at an increasing rate. And you're gonna hear from a futurist this morning, um, as well as a representative from of education from a tech company, Brett Salakis, and they're gonna, be able to tell you a lot more about what those changes might be and what what's coming. But for us as educators, a lot of the time it can be looking into the mist and kind of going like, what's out there? And how do I prepare students for the world when I'm just not 100% sure what that world's going to be? And some of those things are going to be great and some of those things are going to be maybe not so great or maybe they're going to be things that we want our students to be actively able to talk about and advocate for. We want them to be in control of their future. So how do we prepare kids for this? Um, particularly given, I, I used to be able to be fairly sure what careers would be out there um, when my kids graduated. I don't think I can do that anymore. I don't think like even two years or three years down the track if they do a bachelor's degree, I can be 100% sure that the job that they're preparing for will exist the way that they think it will. And so as educators where our job is to prepare kids for the future, how do we do it when the future is changing so rapidly? I wanted to talk to you about that. From an educator perspective, what practical things can we do in the situation we're in, where we don't work for a tech company, we don't know the things that haven't been released yet or the directions they're looking at, when we're just looking at our kids in front of the class and we're going, what can I do for you? to make sure that you are going to be okay. And the first thing I want to say is focus on principles rather than technologies. Because technology is developing so rapidly, I can't tell you what new feature will be out there. We weren't talking about deep fakes two years ago, now as a real issue in schools. So if we talk about technologies, we're always gonna be playing catch up because I guarantee Reddit and the kids will find it first. We're going to be the ones finding out when it is something we have to deal with. So we need to think about what are those underlying principles that will always stay true no matter what the technology is. We know that we're going to have to treat each other with respect, doesn't matter what the technology is. So I don't need to, in my school rules, explicitly say what technology I'm talking about if I go to that principle of how we treat each other about how we respect each other's images, how we treat each other in the classroom and online. When I talk about privacy and security and how important that is for the school, I don't need to mention specific technologies that put that at risk because if I go to the principles, those principles are fairly firm there. New technologies will challenge that, but those core principles remain the same. So when we're speaking to students, we need to acknowledge what technologies are here, but we need to go back take a step backwards to what those principles are about why we care about what we care about and why those rules are there. If we're taking, um, saying no cell phones in the classroom or mobile phones in the classroom, why are we saying that? And what is the principle that we're trying to maintain? That's what we need to talk about. And so that's how we can create really robust classroom rules or school rules and principles that will last in a time where every month that's going to be changing. Now, here's something that I find really important personally. I studied computer science and somehow ended up in a design classroom and continue to explore creativity um, through ceramics and through media. 
Um, and I was lucky enough two weeks ago to be at the Venice Biennale, which if you don't know about it, it's like the Olympics for contemporary art. And we had a Indigenous representative actually win the Golden Lion this year. And it, being there made this really clear to me that if we're preparing kids for a world where things are changing, then we need to make sure that we're teaching creativity in the classroom. And that sounds really glib, but there's a reason I'm saying this. To be creative means that you are looking, taking a step back, looking at the world and making associations and making a statement and doing all those deep thinking. It's not enough to just rote learn. It's not enough to know the basics. You need those. You need foundations to be creative, but you need to go a step further. And the reason this is so important in this changing world is if we're inventing our own jobs, the people who are going to be the best off are the people who are able to look at the world and make unusual associations and go, I might do that instead of that, or here is the opportunity, or here's how I can use this tool. And I can't tell them how to use that tool because it doesn't exist yet. So unless I give them the space to learn how to be creative, then I'm not doing a good job at preparing them. And it is about balance. You can't be all creativity all the time because you also do need to know how to construct a sentence to write a good prompt and to be able to analyse what's spit it, spat out at you from ChatGPT. But you need both. You do need to make time to teach people how to be creative because too often people think that's this halo that we're born with when in fact any creative person you talk to is using different tools to be creative. They just might not always realise it. We can right brain our left brain thinking and it's really important that we structure our lessons to provide those opportunities so that every student knows what to do when they're not sure. We need to make sure that we're really clear about our expectations. There was a stage where there was a lot of people who were wanting to put their head in the sand about AI and hope it goes away. It's not fair on students. If there's a tool out there that's going to help them to do their work better, they're going to want to use it. Just like as teachers, we want to use the tools that will help us do our jobs better. How could we expect anything else from our students? So we need to make sure that we are really explicit about what our expectations are. Every assignment, we need to design it to say, this is what I'm assessing and why I'm assessing, and this is why these rules are in place. So this is um, some images I've created to add to assignments to make it really easy um, and clear across the whole school about what our expectations are. We need to give students a chance to play because you can't just expect that they're going to go out there and be able to take control of this world if we're not teaching them how to learn a new tool. But we need to do it in a way where we're showing them the good things and the bad things that we're having these big discussions. So things like how they can use AI to support their revision, giving them um, work that is both AI and human and asking them to spot the difference and to mark AI work compared to human work and seeing what the differences are. We need to give them that in every single class. It can't just be in a special place because it will be in every area that we work in. And along the way, we need to make sure our students are prepared for the difficult discussions that we're going to have as a society by embracing the fact that we don't have all the answers and some of these questions are scary that we don't know the answers to. Because if our students can't advocate for a better society with technology, then the next generation's in trouble. We need to help them with that. We need to provide space for them to have opinions and to make sure that they know they can change things. And while we're doing all this, we need to make sure that the tools we use protect them. And we need to not do it in a quiet way. We need to tell the kids, this is why we say no to this tool. This is why we say yes to this tool. If you use this tool, they will own your image and they could use it to build a deep fake. By using this tool, as fun as it is, you are giving things away that you might regret later. We need to have those explicit conversations about what schools will use and what we won't and why. And students should be part of that discussion as well. Because if we hide that conversation from them, they're going to make the wrong decisions when they're off by themselves with their phones deciding what to use. And finally, as schools, we need to model risk taking and responsible risk taking. So 
So as a school, we've created Haley, which uh, might have to go through a name change. Um, but it's our AI bot. Um, we've made it for teachers, not for students, because our first iteration had a lot of hallucination. It would make things up. But it's designed to help teachers understand school policies. Because when you join a big school where the you know, there is policy upon policy and procedure upon procedure. And we've got four campuses with three different levels and each one's got their own different rules. You need to make that easier for people to engage with. So we've created this tool and in this journey, we've made mistakes and we've learned from them and we've made adjustments. And so we need to model for the students what it looks like to embrace technology in a safe and um, secure way and what it looks like when something's in development and bring them along in the journey. So next year, I'll be running something called Tech Ventures, where some of my students will be working for the school instead of doing a sport, developing an AI solution that they think the school needs. Now, it won't be out for implementation until it passes through all of our tech checks. So they're going to have to go through that experience of knowing that there are high standards and um, high expectations, but they'll see what it's like to make mistakes. If you've got any questions about something I've shared today, or if you want to reach out, as educators, we learn best from conversation and from talking. So please um, email me. I used to use Twitter a lot more, but then Elon Musk came along. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. I'm really, really happy to chat because that's how I learn. And um, we have to share in times like this and learn from each other. Thank, Thank you, you, Michelle. Wonderful. So much insight. Stay there, Michelle. Don't disappear because those of you who were part of our conference online last week will remember. Oh, I'm not getting any reaction. Those were. You, you, are you, this is. This is. This is magic. Yeah, it, it could be Wilson. This ball has a microphone on it. We're going to throw the ball to anyone who's got a question for Michelle, and you need to be able to catch it and then throw it back to me without damaging anyone's heads, please. That's the important part there. We're only going to do a couple of questions, but before, while you're thinking of a question you might have for Michelle, we're just going to jump over to Erin. Hi, Erin. How are we going? Hi. Good. No questions through the online chat for Michelle just as yet, but I've put it out there that as sporty as you are, Tim, throwing the ball into cyberspace probably is like a little, just slightly beyond yeah, what true. you can do. It's a virtual yeah. ball. Right, so, yes, for me, people, please add your questions to the chat and I'll pass them on when Tim checks in with me. Thank you. We'll keep you on screen there, Erin, so uh, you can sort of put your hand up or let us know. Now, who's got our first question for Michelle? Hands up here. Here we go. We're ready to catch. This is exciting. Are the cameras rolling? We've got the cameras ready to show this because if you drop it, it'll be really funny. <laughs> One for Sue. Okay. Good catch. Into the mic. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Michelle. Um, such great work. And um, I think the principles are so clever because with the complex array of technologies we have to implement, just endless. Uh, how, I'd like to ask you, how do you involve your parent community in that dialogue? So we started off with a webinar and what we found was, um, I don't know, if any other schools have done webinars, and I, I'm saying this out into cyberspace, so someone out there is going to be like, mm -mm, judgy. But we don't always get a lot of engagement in a parent webinar. It was our most well attended webinar. Our parents are asking questions about this, and they know that they want the best for their kids. They know the future is changing, and they want to get as much information as they can about it. Um, when we release the, and, and we're an independent school, so we get to make our own decisions about risk. Um, so we decided that we would allow ChatGPT for 13 plus uh, midway through last year. Um, and so when we did that, we also released supporting information for our parents and allowed them to opt out if they felt that that was against um, their own personal values. We had zero parents opt out. Um, but we did want to um, make sure that they were a part of that journey um, and getting um, as much education as we give our students because it's something that we're going to have more and more interesting conversations with parents about over the years um, because there will be more and more tricky grey areas. Excellent. Good throw. Well done and a good catch. One more question from the floor here. All right, are you ready? 
You ready to catch? And then introduce yourself to, are you ready? Nice work. Oh, that was a nice, okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Julie, um, TAFE Digital New South Wales. Um, so we do, you know, we have COVID, thousands of um, people in our cohorts for education. I was just wondering, do you do um, group teaching online that is the platform for a large class or do you do individual one-on-one? So we, our classes are set up um, over Teams. Um, we have a blended learning structure, so we deliberately decided to have small class sizes but reduced hours because um, we wanted to, anytime a teacher talks, it can be a video. Like, there's no point in us making kids go online to stare at a teacher talking. Um, so we made our, we deliberately rewrote how our school would work for the virtual world so that our classes are no bigger than 10, but fewer hours to compensate for that so that they can, their deep dives. Um, over teams and then we've got the asynchronous nature of teams for them to also collaborate with each other. We also have office hours where they can drop in and be in, you know, sometimes there is only one student who turns up to office hours because that week, you know, only one of them has a question. Um, so we do have that flexibility as well, um, as well as academic coaching time that they can drop into for a study hall if they want to have that one-on-one -on -one time with someone who isn't their teacher, but that can help scaffold their learning. So it's a very different uh, approach to school for us. We didn't just take Halebury face-to-face and go online. Thanks, Michelle. Erin, uh, is there any questions from the online audience? Yes, in fact, there is. Um, one of our online viewers would love to know what your email address is so that they can contact you directly. I have also shared the link to your LinkedIn profile in the online chat, Michelle. Thanks, Erin. Not sure if the slide is visible, but it's on the slide. Um, that is my email address. So feel free to spam me and share it. No, um, send me any questions and reach out because yeah, I do love chatting. Lovely. As you can tell. Thank you so and much. And Michelle's going to be with us all day. Yes. So if you've got any other questions you'd like to ask her offline, you can do that during our mini breaks. Give Michelle a round of applause. Thank you, Michelle. It was delightful.